For today's webinar, uh, we have one of Dell's most valued reseller partners, Sterling. Um, and today you're going to be hearing from Sterling's CTO, Chris Sear. Uh, Chris is responsible for the overall technology strategy, including Sterling's vision of enabling high performance, highly automated cloud and technical innovations. Before joining Sterling, Chris served at the, as the Enterprise Cloud Architect and founding member of the Cloud Pursuit Team, Cloud Execution Team, and Cloud Technology Office for Oracle. With over 28 years of working as a technical evangelist and enterprise architect supporting the federal government, public sector, and commercial markets, Chris is an advocate for the client to cloud offering at Sterling. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris as our presenter. Take it away. Great, thanks Joe. Um, so uh, yes, I am Chris Sear. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've uh, served in the United States Air Force under Special Operations Command up at Herbert Field. Um, spent about um, several decades supporting the warfighter um, in command and control systems. And then uh, I also spent five years uh, working um, for the United Space Alliance, uh, working uh, as a middle tier um, uh, information architect uh, for asset management for Space Shuttle and Space Station uh, down here in Merritt Island, Florida. Uh, so, uh, uh, and then on top of that, uh, I actually worked at Sterling prior to coming back as CTO, uh, as uh, an enterprise architect uh, for them for nine years, uh, doing a, a ton of different engagements with uh, the United States Air Force, Lockheed Martin, and uh, the US Navy to, to name a couple. Um, throughout this time, I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit of a story about something that, um, that I've been doing, you know, uh, uh, outside of my profession, but uh, driving uh, myself, you know, personally forward in creating an impact in how we, um, you know, humanity of ourselves go out saving lives. And uh, there's a little bit of, you know, story about Sterling. There's a, a story about some of the vehicles that I use and, and how they get used. And then the application of, of technology and the culmination of my knowledge and, and my team's knowledge and, and Sterling's capabilities to be able to bring it to this, this next point for the future. Uh, if you see the picture on this, uh, on this first slide, um, there's an interesting story behind this. If you ever saw the uh, the movie Monsters Incorporated, um, there's a there's a you know a little scene where Mike Wazowski, the little green monster, is like, "Oh my God, I'm famous," and uh, you know, and you're looking for him, and there's like down the left hand corner is a little picture of his eyeball. But uh, in this particular picture, this was on the cover of USA Today, and um, you know, and I became famous because right behind that woman's head is the back of my head. <laughs> Uh, we, it was a really great photo opportunity for, for these two people and uh, my partner and I, uh, Bill Zhang, where we, we run this hovercraft rescue team, um, you know, we didn't really know the picture was being taken. The story behind this is the gentleman that is, uh, that's in the hat, he, um, he, was, he decided he needed to walk across to try and save his sister, the, the woman that he's hugging right now, um, and he got stuck. Uh, up on a, a bridge on the interstate that had, that had become overflowed and swift water was flowing over his shoulders and he was pinned up against a concrete embankment. Um, we had uh, one boat uh, from the police force go and try and save him. That boat flipped over and got washed down. A couple of, um, uh, you know, jet skis went out to, to try and wave runners tried to go out and grab them. Those two you know, flipped over and got washed downstream. And then finally we were with uh, the USA Today uh, team and they looked at us and said, hey, would you like to see if you could go rescue this gentleman? And we did, and it took a total of seven minutes for us to do so. And I'll tell you a little bit about that, the capabilities there. Um, the vehicle that, that we did res perform that rescue um, was the one on the left, the big blue one. So, you know, how does, how does Sterling get involved in something like this? You know, it's really interesting. You know, for, for two decades, Sterling has, has provided industry experience. Uh, you know, I'm proud to have taken, you know, uh, a part of, of those uh, two decades across that span, uh, helping, you know, Sterling grow and, uh, you know, and also building my professional career. 
And with that, as I've noticed, we have industry leading partnerships. And it's not just partnerships in which we sell, you know, goods and, and services to our customers. I mean, which is kind of what we do. But but the big thing is that we have strategic partnerships, right? We're we're really in closely with their technology roadmaps. We're really in closely with the way that their business strategy um, is is laid out. And you know, when we work in unison with our vendors to to drive these strategies forward and evangelize them to our customers, right? Because we we believe with our customers, knowledge is power, right? You you all have purchasing power, and if and if you don't know the entire landscape of the of the products and services that can help you achieve your your strategy right your business strategy or or your technical strategy then we would be doing a disservice to you um and on top of that you know our people are one of our greatest assets uh, we have a massively wide range of technical certifications uh all the way you know from you know from vmware to to dell technologies emc red hat uh, you know, the list goes on and on, uh, AWS and, and all of the cloud providers, um, and which not only are, are just our engineers that provide sales engineering and solutioning, but also the delivery aspects of it too. Which is the reason why, you know, you'll probably hear the words client to cloud because that's really what we are. <clears throat> it's really what Sterling does. It's all the way from a handheld device or a laptop or a Chromebook or, or a sensor all the way through the entire range of connectivity um, out into cloud and also with managed services. So we're based, um, our headquarters is based in North Sioux City, South Dakota. You know, um, we've got a little map here. Um, we have additional sales offices in Norfolk, uh, Nebraska, Omaha, uh, Austin, and then uh, we have uh, also some uh, configuration, integration, and distribution centers. Uh, in Sacramento and in Dulles, where we do a lot of our um, packaging and configuration of clients and servers and equipment and getting them completely turnkey ready to deploy to our customers. Now down on the lower right hand side, you'll see Florida with a little rocket ship there. That's where I'm at. I'm in Merritt Island, Florida, just outside the gate of Kennedy Space Center. So, um, you know, I get to walk on my back porch and and see, um, you know, ULA launch the rockets and, and SpaceX do the same. Uh, so it's really, um, it's really a wonderful place to be. Uh, the picture is of our headquarters down the lower right hand side. And right up above that is our brand new solution center where, uh, you know, once everybody's be able to travel, I'd love to invite you out to come see all of the different solutions that we have in person. Um, but we can also provide demonstrations remotely. Now, when we say client to cloud, I mean, it's, it's a great buzzword, you know, uh, things like that. But, but this is what we call Planet Sterling, you know, and right at our core are our client services. It's not just going out and, you know, and selling a Chromebook or selling a, a laptop or a tablet. It's, it's really what do we do to provide added value to our customer. We laser engrave. We can do uh, remediation, redaction of devices into these, into these units. We can configure them using gold disk images. Um, and I mean, we even do things such as, you know, get rid of all the cardboard and, and uh, packing materials and, and put them into, you know, your, your briefcase or your backpacks and asset tag them and, and even embroider them to whatever, you know, logos that you want to have on the outside. All the way to moving out into a more modern data center, right, where we do all the systems integration with, um, with a massive range of, of equipment and software offerings where we provide you know, network design and configuration um, as well as security architectures and identity management, data protection for being able to provide you know, backups and uh, recovery uh, equipment and services. And then as we start branching out into that cloud space, you know, it doesn't just mean we're going out to AWS or, or Azure. We also deal with private clouds and hybrid cloud connectivity as well. We're specialists in software-defined data centers, um, uh, IoT and edge compute, uh, all sorts of, uh, of mission and business continuity, all the way up to a TSSCI cleared level and in the commercial world as well. And then our engineers also do performance optimization 
you know, it's an interesting story. I actually went to go work for United Space Alliance because that was really what I specialized in was solving those problems with, with performance in an entire, uh, you know, data center process. And, uh, and then how do you operationalize cloud? You know, a lot of times what I've experienced when I was, when I was working, you know, at Oracle was, you know, agencies and companies would spend the money to get a cloud environment and then they wouldn't really know the questions to ask like how do i get identity management to work in that how do i how do i make sure that the network that i'm connecting to cloud is secure how is it optimized how do i get you know all of my compute assets to be working right is it sized properly all the way down to like the management operationalization right do your existing systems administrators know how to be able to perform the same tasks that they've done you know, in, a, in an in-prem, on-premises data center uh, to be able to do that in cloud. So that is part of, you know, our cloud story. And then above all, we've got security, right? So as I mentioned before, you know, we're a top secret facility clearance organization. We have cleared personnel uh, that, that go in. We've been doing, you know, STIG checklists for decades, um, you know, on some of the highest performance weapon systems that are that are out across all the agencies. And we apply that even into the commercial sector as well, um, you know, working within HIPAA and, and also within our, you know, our secure supply chain, which we're getting ready to go to uh, CMNC level five. Um, and then the next stage that we had was to go into, you know, the, a managed services provider where if even if you don't understand cloud, even if you you know need work within that data center, even if you you're losing you know some of your resources within the network and security space, we provide managed services across the board for all of those different services. And then the final outer lying ring of this planet is we're here to be able to transform your business, right? We understand the mission and the business requirements that are coming down the pipe because we. We work so hard with our customers to understand that strategic roadmap, both with our vendors and our customers. And then what do we do with all this data? We understand data governance. Um, one of the big things that we did was develop the data governance plan for Missile Defense Agency. And then, you know, then how do you tie all that into to make sure that you're meeting all the regulatory compliance? So that is, that's our entire span from client to cloud, all the way from the smallest device to the largest weapon systems that reach across the globe um, in a most secure and performance optimized process as possible. Um, so how do you get to us, right? So we have, you know, um, we have a bunch of different federal contracts, state local contracts within education as well. We also have, you know, the, the ability to reach out and do business in the commercial space. These are just some of the different areas of the commercial business within the medical world, financial, manufacturing, engineering, but it's not the only far reaching areas, um, you know, within state, local and education. I mean, we go all the way down to, you know, elementary schools that are trying to develop a STEM program and be able to, you know, outfit those classrooms with the right activities and materials so that the teachers don't have to spend all their time doing that work. And then from the federal side, you know, with the new ADMC contract, 2GIT, you know, hopefully coming out. Um, but we also, you know, we're a big Soup 5 contractor, um, as well as, you know, being able to be reached on GSA contracts as well. So we're completely accessible from all areas of our, of our customer base. And then that being said, if you want to see something, if you actually want to see how things work, um, you know, we've created this new solution center at our headquarters. And uh, here's a little picture of it. You know, of course, right now, um, you know, there's, there's additional racks that are going to be in. It's not just the one. But, uh, but we are building this out and we're bringing in, you know, new partners and new solution sets to be able to grow this entire client to cloud, um, uh, you know, uh, idea that we have and strategy that we have for our customer base. I'm not going to read all this to you. This is kind of like an eye chart, but, but there are some really important demonstrations that we're capable of being able to do. Automating, right? How do you automate your, your on-premise and premises and cloud environments? You know, how do you look at cross-cloud Kubernetes management if you're looking at containerization, right? If you've, if you've seen VMware rolling out Tanzu, you know, what, what exactly is Tanzu mission control? And if you are running any, you know, uh, VMware, how do you modernize applications that aren't virtualized? How do you, how do you learn about the CICD pipeline? 
Um, and then of course we have some other demonstrations coming soon, you know, real soon, like within the next couple of weeks as our virtual desktop infrastructure demonstrations and proof of concept capabilities. Uh, you know, everybody is teleworking, you know, it's all the remote work is now like the new normal because of, um, because of COVID. And, you know, being able to, you know, think about creating the right strategy for remote operations is, is extremely important. And so, so I hope that, you know, I've given you a little bit of an overview about, you know, who we are, who, who Sterling is, and, and what we're capable of being able to provide. Um, and with that, knowing all of that, we're going to get into, you know, the next step, which is, well, what about these vehicles? You know, you saw the, the status of, uh, you, know, you know, what exactly is a hovercraft and what exactly is a hover wing? So this is just a really simple picture. What is a hovercraft? You know, a lot of times there's commercials that show like helicopters hovering, you know, and they call those hovercraft. And, you know, that's not really it. It's really a vehicle that you can sit in, right? Or put something on and it uses an air cushion. It's a really simple, kind of a simple vehicle. And uh, it rides on a cushion of air and there's a flexible skirt underneath it where a fan pushes air into the skirt, pushes more air into this cavity. And then as that cavity fills up, it kind of floats like a hockey puck. So there's very little drag, if any, when you are what we call on cushion, okay? And then that fan either, you know, creates the lift and thrust at the same time. Um, our vehicles, we actually do something different. We put our lift fan up front so that uh, we, we're actually the fastest hovercraft in the world. And the reason for that is the air coming from the front as you're going really, really fast um, allows the air to, you know, flow throughout the entire craft and, and we can actually reach speeds greater than any other hovercraft on the planet. So the other neat thing about these vehicles is you can sit still in a rapid. So swift water is not an issue. You can also uh, drive across any terrain, whether it's you know, sand, mud, snow, ice, water. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's one foot chop. It doesn't matter if there's you know, waves. Instead of like a boat where the wave pushes the vehicle you know, along with it, that wave actually goes underneath you. And it's a really kind of a different uh, you know, really kind of a different uh, effect that you feel when you're driving this, right? So we took this hovercraft technology um, through uh, the use of, um, you know, of a, of, of a company that, I'm, that I work with, uh, and we took that technology and we decided to, uh, to listen to the founder of Universal Hovercraft, who is Robert Wint, Uncle Bob, uh, who said, you know what, I think I can make one fly, and I think we can get these vehicles up above the ground, and, uh, you know, and kind of get it a little bit more away from the surface. And so with that came the design, what is called the hover wing. So what is a hover wing? Well, it's really kind of simple. It's a hovercraft with wings, right? But uh, these wings allow it to fly several feet above the surface. So when I say several, normally you want to cruise around five, you know, five, six feet. We can pop up much higher. Um, you know, over those trees in the background, the scenery there. Um, but, uh, but, you know, normally what we'd like to do is kind of stay closer to the surface because it's more efficient for us. Um, this other picture to the right, I had to do kind of, you know, an interesting shot because a lot of people, when they say, oh, you do hovercraft, is it like those big Navy ones, right? So that's a Navy LCAC. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very similar. It is a mathematical formula. The reason why that, that LCAC was created was because they wanted to put an M1 Abrams tank on that vehicle, and that vehicle holds 90 tons. Well, in order to be able to, to do that, it's a mathematical formula that uh, with hovercraft is very simple, and uh, the dimensions of that vehicle actually match the type of weight that uh, the vehicle needs to transport. So, um, so as you can see in this particular craft, this hover wing has a fan up front. Uh, this has gull wing doors. The wings are removable, so it's easy to transport. And, um, you know, and it has uh, some really interesting specifications. But how did we get there, right? So how did all of this come to fruition and why are we having this discussion now? So I wasn't always, I'm not an aerospace engineer. That's not what my, you know, degree was ever in. I actually became um, kind of involved in this by being a science fair judge. 
And I met, uh, I met this middle school kid that built one of those plywood hovercrafts with a leaf blower, and I thought it was really neat. And then I met uh, Bob Wint, and I met his nephew, Bill Zhang, who's my partner. And uh, we, you know, he showed me this vehicle that flew, and I was like, wow, uh, I need to kind of show this to AFSOC. And 15 years ago, I demonstrated its capabilities. So, uh, you know, there's a little picture of me flying across, if anybody knows Northwest Florida, this is, uh, you know, just out on the other side of Hurlburt Air Force Base, and I'm flying in the sound. Eventually, we put military members inside of it and flew them in that, and they were like, this is the most amazing thing in the world. I want 100 of these things for a bunch of different missions. It was primarily originally going to be used for infiltration and exfiltration instead of all those inflatable boats that you see special operators in um, that have to lift them and crawl across, you know, reefs and sandbars and drag them up and bury them and do all sorts of other things to, so that they can go do their mission. We could fly, land, they climb out, turn around, fly back, slide into a helicopter, and you know, uh, no, one, no one else was the wiser. So that looked really, really well. Now notice that date, August of 2005. So the reason why this is important is because the top speed of the hover wing is 100 miles an hour. Cruises around 70. Um, its maximum range is about 600 miles. We can, of course, increase it by adding more fuel. Uh, we like to say the max high flying height because of the FAA is 15 feet. Um, that skirt, that flexible skirt that I talk about is 14 inches of clearance between the vehicle and the ground. And the engines that we use are American made. They're uh, General Motors Ecotech supercharged engines with uh, Briggs and Stratton in the front for lift. Although we do use uh, electric motors, um, you know, if necessary, um, we've done that before too. It seats up to six people. And the kind of the max weight capacity is about 1,200 pounds. We go higher. It really depends on the on the amount of lift. It's that mathematical formula that I was telling you about. Um, but we like to kind of stay around the 1,200 pound, uh, you know, category for this particular vehicle, right? So then we get this wonderful conversation with the military, and they so you know they said, "Well, draw up a concept." So this is what we had. It was called the XRW. Uh, it was really cool because we they wanted to put a gun on it. They wanted to do all these other things. So we developed this this concept, right? And uh, you'll notice this vehicle, right? A um, lot more smoother lines, and and we developed you know this the same concept. It was it was supposed to be called uh, the the hat, the hover wing all terrain transport, um, and it was a great concept. And we were moving forward with it. But then remember, I told you August two thousand five. So what happens less than a month later? So Hurricane Katrina hits, and as I mentioned before, I just flew a whole bunch of people to include congressmen and senators and stuff like that. Katrina comes in and wipes out the city. Now these are my pictures. These are pictures that you know th that we took uh, 15 years ago. You'll notice that one of them is Canal Street uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, if you remember this hurricane, uh, you know the news agencies were saying, "Get to the Superdome." Well, the Superdome is in the top middle picture. If you notice how much water is there, it was a little bit difficult for people to get to the Superdome, right? So there was a lot of disinformation as far as, um, as, far as where to go, how to be able to even get there. Um, and, uh, and not only that, but the water itself had 46,000 times the amount of E. coli in it, right? So how do you capture, how do we capture data on, you know, throughout this disaster? Well, we didn't. The only capacity that we had, it was before iPhones, right? So we had our own cell phones, towers were down. Uh, we, you know, we would text people with the hopes that if we ever caught a glimpse of a cell phone signal that that text message was, would go out. If we did get a signal, then we would make a land marker and put it on a paper map to make sure that if we needed to make a call that we would go back there and do it. So, you know, we didn't know what the water was like, the quality was like, we didn't know who to be able to deal with. You know, it was really kind of difficult. But there were several good things that came out of it. One was, we didn't just go in there. We actually went in uh, through a congressman's uh, congressional order. And this is it right here. Um, and the reason why this is so important was because the line that, that he put in there was, that was so impactful was, any attempt to interfere in their already legally arranged use will be pr prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. 
This enabled us to get past every single roadblock. FBI, didn't matter, federal law enforcement, you know, um, New Orleans PD. It allowed us to be able to work with people and it allowed us to be able to go out and do the things that we wanted to do. But we still didn't have a rescue vehicle, right? I had to grab seven vehicles from all over the country, people we, we you know, um, congregated at a particular point and the vehicles were all different sizes and shapes. None of them were based to perform rescue, okay? But some interesting things did take place. One was National Guard pulled up and said, hey, do these things fit in helicopters? And we said, you know what? We've never done that before. And you said, you want to? And I said, uh, sure, that sounds like fun. And so here we are loading one of our vehicles into a Chinook helicopter. Um, you know, it, it is rather interesting. They got tired of rescuing people one, you know, one at a time. They got tired of dropping that hoist. You've probably seen the videos, right? Where they're dropping this hoist and picking up victims and then pulling them up one at a time and then flying away. Instead, we launched these vehicles from the water slid down, went from land to water to land throughout all these neighborhoods in New Orleans and picked up several people at a time. They would walk up onto the ramp and then they would fly. Once they got full, they would fly off and, uh, and do rescue. We would stay, pick up more people. And we managed to save hundreds and hundreds of people's lives um, because of that, right? So, so we learned a lot, right? And because we learned a lot, we said, you know what? We need to build our own rescue vehicle. We need to take everything that we learned during Hurricane Katrina, and we need to figure out how to be able to build a rescue vehicle. So this is what we did. We built one. It had a smaller thrust duct because we kept dealing with power lines, right? We wanted to make sure it was enclosed in the event that we were dealing with foul weather, whether it was cold or whether it was you know, hot, we could air condition it for people. Um, and uh, we also wanted some protection from the elements. Um, this is uh, you know, kind of a, an interesting rescue uh, you know, we, uh, we actually, you know, did like the snowmobile uh, simulation rescue, being able to pick somebody up uh, to be able to perform a rescue like this in a boat. There's moving parts in the water. There's no moving parts in this vehicle. So even if there, it is swift water and we run them over, nothing happens to that person, right? Um, on top of that, there's no gunnels. So if this, uh, like a boat does. So if we're picking up this person, it's only four inches above that, that site. We could actually drop off skirt and slide that person up onto the craft and get them on a backboard and take care of the injuries. So there was a ton of, of information that we gathered during that first operation. And then, you know, what happens if you're doing ice rescue? Well, even on thin ice, the standard operation for ice rescue is tie a rope around a first responder, they crawl out on hands and knees, and they just keep crawling out until they pick somebody up and then drag them back in. Well, that's extremely slow, extremely dangerous for the rescuer, and we can actually get there at 50 miles an hour, pick them up and, drag, and, and put them in to, to safety and get them to an ambulance and get them out. So we've been, you know, we're really fired up when we developed this, this vehicle. And remember, this is quite a, quite a while ago, back, you know, 2007, 2008. Well, while we were so excited about this, you know, we decided we're going to, every natural disaster that comes through, we're going to ask, we're going to, we're going to do the same thing that we did during Hurricane Katrina. So Hurricane Irene comes about, and this one was a doozy, right, up in the, uh, up in the Northeast. So this happened in 2011. So all this media is going on, and I decided, you know what? I saw what was happening, what was getting ready to happen in New York. And so I called Mayor Bloomberg's office and I got an email address. So I sent this email. This is the actual email that I sent, that I sent uh, to, uh, to Mayor Bloomberg. And this was my response, you know, thank you for contacting the city of New York. You know, we're gonna forward you to the appropriate agency and here is your, you know, for future reference, it's a help desk ticket, right? Sincerely, the city of New York. Um, take a wild guess what happened. Do you think I got a call? Do you think anybody called me or contacted me or emailed me, right? Absolutely not, got nothing. Meanwhile, people are still sitting in destroyed areas trying to get rescue and tons of lives were lost. People you know, were injured and they didn't have that level of capacity, which made me get even more angry and continue to send more letters when everything you know, took place. So this isn't just the only one. I mean, we did Ike, we did, you know, I mean, these, I have a stack of letters like this and responses like this from federal agencies, um, you know, that I could, I could take up more than just the time that we have allotted to discuss this, right? So, but there were some successes. 
as I mentioned before, you know, that very first picture of that, uh, of that man that we saved, this is a picture of those boats and, that, and those wave runners, right? This is what happened to, and there were people in these vehicles, right? And those people in those vehicles washed two miles downstream and they had to get rescued as well. Well, guess what happens when you're rescuing rescuers? Now it's a force subtractor because now there's multitudes of people that can't go out and save lives, right? And so we worked with a bunch of different law enforcement agencies during Harvey. You'll notice here, this is, this is how some people, you know, how they go off and save people or, or sweep houses in the event of a flood. Now, Harvey, some of the water, you couldn't even do this because it was over your head. It was 10, 15 feet deep in water, you know, but we could slide up onto the roof and we could pound on the roof. And if somebody was there, we'd swing an ax and, you know, open it up and pull people out. But, you know, even 12 years later, there's no data that is, that is helping this law enforcement officer go inside that house. Doesn't know if there's volatile organic compounds while we're standing there, if we're breathing it. They don't know if what the quality of the water is, if there's fuel in it, or if there's, you know, different bacterial growth. We don't know if a dam is burst. We don't know anything. We have no data whatsoever that was taking place at this point. And, you know, and this is just three years ago. So, you know, that just encouraged me to keep moving forward. And so what happened after Hurricane Harvey? Then we had Irma, Maria, right? And then in, and then in 2018, Hurricane Florence came up. And so um, myself and another Sterling member, Scott McDuff, my partner, um, you know, and, and, a, and a ton of other people all got together. Shane Wilkie, um, who operated the big, <clears throat> the big vehicle that you see the video of, um, we went to Burgon, North Carolina, because there were seven horses that were getting ready to die, and a family got evacuated by helicopter, and they weren't even allowed to take any of their additional pets. So, um, so we were in Raleigh at the time, and it took us six hours to go 90 miles. It took us six hours to go 90 miles because we didn't know what roads were open or closed. We didn't know what law enforcement we were going to run into. We didn't know if, uh, like, like this uh, picture on the lower left-hand side, when you look at that picture, you don't just turn around and head the other way, right? Your, you know, your GPS doesn't tell you what roads are flooded. This fire truck basically was blocking the street because, <clears throat> because this county ran out of road signs telling them that the road was washed out, right? This was 20 miles in, so we had to turn back around, go find another way, right? And all the while, there's, you know, there's animals and people that are going through this water in North Carolina, right? Now, the picture on the right-hand side, if you look at that, you'll notice that's a, that's a telephone and a power pole, right? Well, they're pretty tall. Um, the roof of the house is right there, and you would think that the water, you know, that house, right, probably about eight feet deep, well, I thought so too until they told me that these houses were on stilts. So now imagine what you're dealing with. If you're going through in a boat with a motor, there's cars, there's, you know, all sorts of obstacles under the water. None of that is mapped. You literally have no idea what is sitting underneath that surface. And, you know, in my team, we're swimming, we're, we're swimming the big horses out because we didn't have capability to be able to get them, you know, out via hovercraft. So you know, now we had to swim them out two and a half miles to safety. So we learned a lot, right? We learned a ton just two years ago based upon the actions that we, you know, that we did, right? And how on earth did you, you know, could you get a horse on a hovercraft? So this is the world's first, first time ever um, that anyone was ever to get, you know, a large animal onto a hovercraft. And this is a 21 foot cargo vehicle that we, that we have. Um, that we've built. You know, and when you and when you take a look at that you know, there's a lot of things that you've got to do to be able to get a horse to jump out of water and onto a platform like this, 
took me about 45 minutes. Uh, I'm a certified equine first responder. I uh, work a lot with horses. I own a couple. Um, and it took me about 45 minutes for, to an hour to get this pony to trust me, to be able to trust me to jump up. Um, the gentleman who was in the water, uh, you know, helping me was my farrier. So he understood horses as well. But we had to get them out of the water. Because if you don't get them out of the water or get them to safety, they die. And in Hurricane Harvey, I saw a lot of, you know, dead livestock and, and, and dead animals and, and dead horses as well. So, you know, the capability of this vehicle is extremely important, not just for saving human lives, but saving animals' lives too. This is another Mike Wazowski moment for me because the only thing that you're seeing now is just my, you know, wet jeans because I had to jump out of the water and then jump up on the deck. So all of that, do you think that we had, even in 2018, with the iPhones and drones and, you know, and, and, you know, smartphones and data, big data and analytics and all of this stuff, do you think that that is prevalent in these environments? The answer is no, it's not. We still had law enforcement agencies, multiple law enforcement agencies coming down to Burgos, sweeping the same areas of land that we had already done, right? We had swept land that they had already done, you know? Um, people who were coming in had no idea what their houses would look like and nobody would take them out to visit their houses. So we did. We had cattle that nobody knew how to be able to get food there. So sheriffs were taking, you know, a 45 pound bale of hay and putting it in one little John boat and taking it out to feed a hundred head of cattle. We were able to take 45 bales of hay and put it on our large vehicle and transport that out to save those cattle, you know? So, there's, you know, this is something I say a lot, right? There's something that happens when you're standing alone on a hovercraft in a city that's 10 feet underwater with nothing else around you, no cell phone towers, you know, your GPS doesn't work because your GPS is probably, you know, Google Maps and because your cell's not working, you lose signal, right? You get this particular perspective, you know, and as a technologist, I'm, you know, I want to have this solution, right? There's got to be a better way. So, I decided, okay, I'm gonna take the Hoverwing platform that we wanted to utilize for everything that we did, you know, 15 years ago as we would constantly show videos, right? And I wanna turn this into a data platform. And the reason why this is so important is we do this. Okay, not a helicopter. Anybody can fly it. You don't need a pilot's license to fly it. If it's on the water, it's registered as a boat. If you're on land, it's registered as an ATV, right? It's, and it's 30 times cheaper than a helicopter to operate, right? And that's all well and good in terms of that vehicle. But the biggest, most important thing is what do you do with a, with a platform? Because that's really what this is about. It's a platform because I, you know, we need to start collecting data. So what happens in a natural disaster? So I, so I decided we're going to take this platform and we're going to go to our vendors and we're going to talk about, you know, capabilities and, and what this vehicle can do. And I'm building this, this data platform. Right? So we want sensors on it. We want to look at the volatile organic compounds. We want to look at wind speed and direction. You know, what is the carbon monoxide level, you know, in the areas? Is it safe? Can we breathe? You know, how hot or how cold is it? Are we going to get hypothermic if we go into the water, right? Is the barometric temperature falling, you know? Um, how deep is that water? Uh, you'd be amazed that even the law enforcement agencies' boats didn't have depth meters. I watched outboard motor outdrives get completely destroyed as they would cruise across the street. You know, um, GPS information to be able to to be able to track and target things and write things down and record it. Right? I want to do lidar for three dimensional mapping of of dangerous areas, and also you know water quality data loggers. Right? Am I jumping into something that is acid? Am I jumping into something that's safe? 
Um, you know, and that's just the sensor part. And then cameras, you'll notice that, you know, the quality of the video is not good because why? Well, we had, you know, we did have GoPro cameras, but when you're neck high in water, that doesn't really work out very well unless you're mounted on your, on your helmet, you know? So we didn't really have the helmet mounts. And then what do you do with that data? You pull out the little SD cards or a USB and plug it into laptops, which is really what we had. You know, and then sometimes you'd accidentally touch a button and it wouldn't record. You know, um, I, I mentioned infrared and the reason why that is so important is in case you don't know, no one does rescue at night. There is no such thing as night rescue. So if you're sitting on the roof of your house and the sun's going down, be prepared because you're sleeping there. And then someone in the daytime will come get you. Everybody, I mean, it, it still amazes me. So, I mean, we've got to be able to, if we have intelligence, if we have the data, we know that it's still safe out there, we can actually go out and perform rescue at night. And then, of course, three-dimensional image sensors, right? Because we need to know what that terrain is going to look like. There's a lot of things that stick up out of the ground that you don't necessarily, you know, see. Right? We also want to be able to record in high definition because we're going to use machine learning to determine if there is a snake swimming across the water. Because guess what? Snakes swam across us all the time when we were sitting chest high in, in Burgon, North Carolina. Fire ant balls, if you've never heard of that. But those are, you know, those are extremely painful, right? So we want to be able to record that. And we want to be able to record in every different direction because not everybody can just see with our eyes and detect a threat or detect something dangerous or detect someone or something that needs to be saved. And then audio, right? We want to be able to record. We want to be able to record and listen because we may not hear everything, right? We want to be able to record that audio. Maybe we're hearing a cow moo or a cat whine or, you know, or a dog bark and we've missed it because our engines are, you know, are running behind us. And then, you know, just with that, those type of, you know, sensors, then what are our engines doing, right? How long am I operating this road? Does my temperature go up as I'm idling? You know, what is my, what is my efficiency for my engines? And then am I putting the right load onto these vehicles? What's my airspeed if I'm flying? What's the vibration like? Um, you know, how much am I in a tilt when, I'm bring, when I am loading up a horse on a hovercraft, right? What is the water flow and velocity of the, of the surface that's underneath me? You know, how far away is, is what I'm getting ready to fly towards, right? How far away is, a, is an object that I see? And then as well as that is like medical data you know, as we were going through this process of rescue, there wasn't anything that was recording anything about us. You know, I mean, let me tell you something. When you're getting ready to jump into a, into a flooded area, into water that you have no idea what's underneath you or, or anything like that, it's a little stressful. So the heart rate will go up, right? If you're, you know, as you're working, as you're swimming a horse out two and a half miles, your oxygen sat rate is kind of important, Right. And then if you're bringing people in that are sick, you wanna be able to get some vitals relatively quickly and be able to record that. So those are just some of the minimum requirements that I was looking at for this, you know, for this platform. But what does that bring? It brings all types of data, right? Video, pictures, audio, streaming data from different you know, devices, right? Structured data, unstructured data, bioinformatics, you know, machinery information, depending upon what we're, you know, what we're doing. If we've got drones that are attached, what's going on with all of that data? Is there geopositional data on tags and, and things that we've targeted, right? All of that requires processing need. You know, we got to have a high speed data capture network. We got to have data storage capability that can quickly record all of this and trap all of this and keep it safe, right? Um, we got to be able to reconfigure things in the field because guess what? You know, things change in, in periods of, of disaster and periods of need and, and you can't go back and you can't redesign something, right? And then we also want to be able to have processing capability on the vehicle so that we don't have to reach back somewhere else to be able to provide it so that we can have actionable intelligence while we're going through, you know, this, this journey during a disaster response. And then we also do need cloud connectivity, right? We want to be able to utilize the cloud um, AI and analytics, or we want to be able to use, you know, some additional cloud resources. We might want to be able to send this information back to people that they can be able to see it at an emergency, you know, uh, uh, center, right? Management center. So those were just some of the initial processing needs. 
So Brad Moore, our CEO, uh, my boss, one of the things that he told me as I was getting ready to become CTO for, for Sterling, he said, Chris, I want you to think of Sterling as your candy store. And I want you to build solutions that are going to make a difference that our customers can do something with. And so, you know, I, 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 to this day, I love that because I do, I do use our vendor partnerships and our customers as, and I think them of ways of being able to take the, all these new pieces of technology to be able to develop solutions in which we can help our customers, right? So that's what I did. I went to the candy store. And in doing so, created like this initial design. I didn't want a ton of different vendors. You know, I wanted to look at some, some capabilities. So with Dell and EMC, you know, we've got a really, a, a really good relationship. Um, and we get to look at, you know, roadmap strategies and things like that. And, and, you know, we were taking a look at this new power scale architecture. And it was really kind of funny because as everybody was looking at it and putting it in, you know, putting it in our, our solution center and putting it in a big rack and everything, I'm looking at it and going, wait a minute, it's, it's all uh, solid state. How much does it weigh? What's its power consumption? You know, what is, what are its temper? And I'm asking Dell this, right? And um, I guess they, you know, they weren't too ready for all of the environmental impact and they didn't really know where I was going with this. But once they did, they realized that, you know, a solution like this can definitely, you know, can definitely change things, right? So I looked at this all flash array and, and I saw what they were doing with, you know, the, the, um, the resiliency of the actual platform. And the fact that they're one U, so I can have a, an entire cluster um, that's only three U, right? Very small, very lightweight, and extremely capable of being able to ingest all of this data because of its high performance. And then being able to encrypt it uh, and compress it and, uh, you know, and dedupe it too. So, so that, you know, we're, we're kind of utilizing that. And then, well, what do we do for, you know, connectivity? And we're looking at the, the you know, the gateway, the edge gateway because they, it does have LTE. It doesn't necessarily, you know, we may run into places where there is cell phone connectivity, right? But we wanna be able to provide wireless. We wanna be able to use things like LoRaWAN and Zigbee, you know, to be able to, to create these mesh networks where they don't ever exist, right? Um, and then, you know, have battery backup. Utilize things from APC with, they, they make this really, you know, lightweight, if you've ever dealt with, you know, uninterruptible power supplies and you've had to move them around in the past they were all lead acid battery well now they're all lithium ion so when you're looking at the weight of some of these power supplies and the capability of being able to generate power they're phenomenal so you know put one of those in there right and then a sensor platform utilizing intel and i've been working with intel for years um, i was one of their original customers on their very first real sense uh, depth camera but now they've got a ton of other cameras. They've got, they've got this LiDAR camera, the 515, it's the size of a hockey puck, right? I mean, it's extremely inexpensive. Um, then you've got a tracking camera that, um, you know, you can, you can utilize software to, to no matter where you're moving, that it keeps track of where that object is. Uh, you know, you put that on a gimbaled platform, right? And then you take a look at, um, you know, their depth camera. Their depth camera now can model and do three-dimensional depth modeling up to 20 meters. And you pair that into Intel's, you know, open source, open Vino, you know, uh, machine learning uh, a vision kit. Then we're going to be able to say, don't jump in the water or there's a dog over there or there's a snake over there or there's a threat over there, right? Um, look at white water, see if water's moving, right? We can, we can see without, you know, with all of these different sensors and record it and go through that, you know, entire process. So through that system, you know, design, we're going to put all this stuff together. We're going to mount it in that flying platform, right? And we're going to put it into this. This is the new hover wing. This is the new one that we're going to be putting together, right? Still removable wings. The top is removable. Um, we've shielded the lift fan so that, uh, you know, uh, objects can't, you know, easily get into it. Um, still have all the same operating characteristics. And uh, it's a good looking vehicle too. Um, the rigid wing that, uh, that we actually created, um, we worked in unison with the United States Air Force Academy. Dr. Tom McLaughlin uh, helped develop a, uh, a wind tunnel model to get us a, uh, a really good wing shape. So, uh, so that's like the, you know, the new vehicle that we're, that we're going to be looking at building.
So that's all well and good, but I mean, you know, what exactly are we going to do? Yeah, we'll put the equipment in there. We'll have this really great looking vehicle. But as I mentioned before, this is a technology demonstration platform for our customers, right? And for our vendors. This is where I take my perspective and we turn it into actionable data. This is how we show our customers how to do this, right? Not just art of the possible, not just, oh yeah, you could do that. You know, we could, you know, we could put something like that together. This is going to be, this is how you're going to be able to do it. Best practices, blueprints, solution sets to be able to do that. And then if you take that, in my previous presentation, I had a question like, well, what other use cases can you do other than just disaster response? Well, you can apply this towards cargo transport, range operations, surveillance, Autonomous vehicle testing. We have built autonomous vehicles on these platforms for the US military, right? Maritime security, threat response deterrence, personnel transport, you know, it seats six people, as well as ambulance services that are not necessarily disaster related. If you look at the type of neck and back injuries that happen with people on wave runners and ambulances can't get out to those people, especially if it's swift water, right? So we want to be able to take all of that, create all of the, the solution set and turn it into a technology demonstrator, right? But what about part two? You know, you mentioned, if you saw the link, this is all about part one. Um, that's exactly what this is, a multi-part series, right? So, so part one was I'm telling you all about this. Here's, here's why we're going to do this. Here's the impact that we're going to be able to provide. Well, now part two is we're going to build it out. And we're going to chronicle the progress, good or bad, right? You know, if there's something that we learn along the way, or we got to add a new, you know, vendor or brings additional things in based upon stuff that we've discovered, then we're going to do that. And then we want you to see it in person, all right? We want to, we want to be able to show you that this is the art of the how. This is how you're going to be able to do, provide things like that, right? Take you for a ride, you know? It's not just going to be the vehicle and the operator in, in, in this big platform. This is a small subset of what's going to be inside there. And then we can start collecting data and analyze it. And then we wanna present that data, which will help us open up new opportunities to make that impact, right? I do not want personally to jump in to chest high water in any town that has been flooded again. I wanna stay on top of it. And if I do get in the water, I wanna know that that water is safe and the people that are with me, that their lives are safe, right? And right now, across the globe, that doesn't exist. It truly doesn't. So that's part two. And then later, right? What do we do with all of this? You know, I'm talking about actionable data, right? Well, there's, you know, this pandemic and post-pandemic, the surge of data that is being performed. What happens in a natural, if we get a natural disaster during this pandemic, right? How do we integrate with other agencies during all of this? You know, do we implement blockchain to create these secure supply chains for equipment as we, as we start to roll this out? You know, there's a couple of other acronyms called Beacon and Oasis. That may be another, you know, description for the future, right? But these are things that Sterling is looking at it in terms of new technological platforms. And then I mentioned quantum computing, and this is not like some buzzword that you always see in the press. Um, a, I'm an actual certified quantum programmer. I've worked with D-Wave uh, systems for about going on four years now. Uh, and, you know, I work on all the other different types of quantum platforms. So now imagine being able to take this data, put it into a system that's 150 million times faster than any piece of silicon, and do something with it that enables you to save lives. Um, and then, you know, take the internet of things, take those sensors, do something with all of our new, all of our vendor platforms, right? And then develop artificial intelligence from client to cloud using, you know, TensorFlow or, or Watson or, or, you know, Soul Machines that will, you know, enable you to do some digital human and AI. So I hope that you kind of understand where I'm, you know, where I'm headed towards this, where Sterling is headed towards this, why we believe that this is so important and how much we're willing to be able to help you solve your problems. And with that, I thank you for your time. I know your time is valuable. Um, thank you for signing up for this uh, and I'm open to questions.
Chris, thank you so much. We will uh, give it a minute or two to see if any questions uh, come in. Um, I will say on behalf of Dell, we're very excited um, that you've chosen uh, some of our products for this uh, project and mission. Um, and we really appreciate your partnership. Um, let's see, doesn't look like any questions yet. So if, uh, if nobody else has anything, um, thanks again, Chris. This was really uh, insightful, um, really great presentation, great mission, um, and, and we're really happy to be a partner with Sterling. Um, for those of you on the phone, please do not hesitate. Please reach out to uh, any one of your contacts from Dell and or Sterling, um, whether it be about the hover wing or any of your um, technology needs or questions. Um, please take a look at Chris's email on the screen um, and to either reach out, thank him, ask questions, uh, anything at all. Um, with that, uh, I will go ahead and close this. Doesn't look like any questions have popped up. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for your time today. We really appreciate it. And take care.